I'd like to echo my uh, thanks for uh, the Breakthrough Prize, Prize Committee for recognizing the work that we've done to, to develop the therapy that Adrian talked about earlier today. And also, I'd like to thank you for, for being with us today. Um, I'm going to do an experiment, and so I've never given this talk before, so if I do, uh, don't do well, it's a failed experiment. I'm sure everybody in the audience has had failed experiments uh, in their career. So what I wanted to do is, is sort of give you an idea of what uh, I, I see the future of medicine being. And uh, I'm actually going to start off uh, describing what I see that future is. Then I'll, what I'll do is walk through, I, I think we're closer to this future than many of you may anticipate. And, and so really, I, I see with the advancements that we have in genomic medicine, uh, by being able to do DNA sequencing uh, for very low cost, that uh, you'll see in the future, all newborns will get uh, uh, genetic testing. And for those of us who have passed that period of time, uh, we'll have adult genetic testing as well. And that will uh, identify predicted disease risk uh, associated with our uh, slight differences. And just to put this in context, there are uh, approximately three billion base pairs in our DNA. There's hundreds of thousands of variations in this room. Uh, so my, my DNA is slightly different uh, than, than yours. And it's these variations that contribute to our genetic traits and also, uh, unfortunately, uh, make us at risk for, for developing uh, uh, diseases. And so for those diseases where there is a genetic basis, I see that gen uh, genome sequencing as well as epigenome sequencing as uh, being used to help predict uh, disease risk. I think what uh, I originally was thinking this could be done in 10 years, but I think this next box down here uh, is probably going to delay this, uh, and it's probably more likely uh, 20 years, is that uh, there are a lot of bioethics uh, uh, issues that we have to resolve before we can fully implement uh, this strategy, and, and uh, uh, part of that is also education of, of the public, uh, uh, that uh, how to utilize this information for, for uh, uh, their, their own benefit. And ultimately, I see that uh, this genetic information is going to uh, allow us to make lifestyle changes early in life uh, where they'll have the biggest impact. For those uh, people who are at risk of developing a disease, so such that you know, if you find a, a risk gene for cancer, you'll do frequent monitoring for cancer. Uh, if you don't have that risk gene, you can decrease the amount of monitoring that you're doing, and, and that's going to uh, uh, save healthcare costs. And then finally, for uh, some diseases, you may want to start treating prophylactically, and I'll give you an example of that to, in, in my talk. And uh, that could include small molecule drugs, uh, protein-based drugs, as well as uh, what I'll focus on is some of the genetic medicines. And part of the reason I wanted to focus there is that it's my belief that uh, the genetic medicines are really where the future is going to be. Uh, uh, developing small molecule drugs is very effective, but it's also quite expensive. And the expense comes not so much from the work that it takes to find that small molecule drug, but the failures. And with genetic medicines, I see a way that we, we can utilize the information that's encoded in our genome to decrease the number of failures that we have going forward. So, Ultimately, I think it's going to be more cost effective uh, uh, for us as a society to sort of embrace these genetic medicines. Today they're expensive, but I, I do see that uh, uh, long term they're going to be one of the solutions that we utilize. So how do we get there? And, and so before I, uh, we, we can get there, I wanted to sort of give you where we've been. And uh, this is a publication that was describing the gene that caused Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease is a uh, inherited neurological disease, and for those of you who are old enough to remember Woody Guthrie, it's what uh, Woody Guthrie died from. And, and so uh, it was known that it was an inherited disease, but it wasn't uh, really identified what causes the disease until this landmark publication in 1993. And the reason I highlighted it is that if you look at the author list, this is like some of the uh, astronomy, uh, astrophysics papers where there's hundreds of people listed on the paper. But in this case, there were 58 scientists that were listed that, that contributed to this work. And most of those scientists spent 10 years to track down this, this uh, uh, gene. This does not include all the lab technicians and, and other people that helped uh, do the work. So there are you know, literally hundreds of people that were involved in, in identifying that gene. Uh, that, work really spawned the modern genomic error. And uh, eight years later, we had the complete sequence of the human genome. And again, that was a very expensive effort that we, we undertook to, to get the complete sequence of the human genome. It uh, took roughly 15 years and, and $3 billion in, in cost to get that. 
Um, but today, that's had dramatic impacts. And so if you look at the, the cost today to sequence anybody in this room, it's roughly gone from $100 million uh, uh, you know, 18 years ago to under $1,000. So, and I see that cost uh, continuing to, to drive down as we develop new technologies for uh, sequencing. Uh, in, in the future. So it's going to make it very affordable and, and it, it will be an important part of how we manage our health in the future. Um, also what's happened is that because we have, it's very inexpensive now to uh, sequence the genome, we have identified the genetic causes for a large number of diseases and uh, I think the number is well over 6,000 genes that have been identified today that either are directly contributing to a disease uh, th through a genetic mutation or genetic change or indirectly contributing uh, to a disease. So the uh, number of genes that, that were, uh, are potentially serving as drug targets, and uh, I should mention I, I am a, a, a drug hunter. I've been working in the industry for 35 years now. Uh, the number of genes that, that's increasing is, is increasing dramatically, and so I think you know, within 20 years, we'll know what most of the genes in our body are doing and how they're contributing to health and disease. So the, the problem is, how do we translate these exciting scientific findings into therapies that will help patients? And as I said earlier, I think uh, genetic medicines will play a key role in our future, and I'll show you one example in the next slide. So just to remind you, uh, the, the central dogma of life is that DNA is where we uh, store the information that, that codes for our, 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 our cells. It, that's transcribed into an intermediate molecule called RNA, and uh, I'm really a pleasure being at Berkeley today because uh, it, it's been a really hotbed of RNA science over the last 50 years or so, uh, and, and one of our early uh, scientific advisor boards was a, a Berkeley professor. Um, and, but the RNA then gets translated to protein, and most drugs today, uh, uh, that I should step back, that uh, most diseases are recognized as, as being uh, diseases either through abnormal proteins, so you have a mutation in a gene that causes the protein to function abnormally, or you're missing that protein uh, due to a deletion or a mutation that causes it to not be translated, or um, that maybe there's something going on in the cell that, that uh, harms that protein, and so you have a lot of uh, uh, other modifications that can occur. And so as a result, most of the drugs that we have today uh, are targeting proteins. So there's both small molecule drugs, things like Lipitor or aspirin or uh, uh, ibuprofen, or biologics. And, and antibodies are a great example of some of the biologics that are uh, being uh, utilized today. Um, the, um, uh, and these have been very effective uh, going for, uh, in the past. What I'd like to do is describe some alternative approaches. And so we use a technology called antisense oligonucleotides. And so what we do is that we use the information that's coded within the DNA, R, uh, the RNA structure using the Watson-Crick base pairing recognition rules. So we have a, 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 an ability to tune our, our drugs to bind only to one RNA in the cell, uh, no other RNA using Watson-Crick base pairing rules. And when we do that, the uh, 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 oligonucleotide can evoke a number of different changes in the cell, uh, including a number of different enzymes that we utilize to degrade the RNA. RNA-SH is one of the enzymes that we use quite a bit. Uh, there's another enzyme called uh, ALGO2 or RISC. Uh, you heard earlier about it. It's an siRNA trigger mechanism. But there are a variety of enzymes that we can use to cause that RNA to go away. So if you remove the RNA, you no longer make the protein. And so it's a very simplistic uh, approach for, for treating diseases is that you prevent the protein from ever being produced. Alternatively, and as you heard from Adrian's uh, talk earlier today, we can use oligonucleotides to um, uh, perturb intermediate metabolism of the RNA, such as modulating splicing and, and helping the cell decide which intron or which, I'm sorry, which exon to, to use. And there are a number of other ways that we can use oligonucleotides to modulate the, the biology that's going on. So, um, this isn't Star Wars. Um, there are six uh, drugs that have been currently approved by the FDA for treating a variety of different diseases, including viral infections, uh, oops, sorry, uh, high cholesterol, and uh, a number of neurological diseases, which has been an area that uh, we're, we're finding this to be very amenable to this technology. And there are over 50 drugs that are currently in clinical trials that are being tested to, to ultimately hope you know, not all of them are going to work, but uh, hopefully a large percentage will work and uh, be able to treat uh, even a, a broader spectrum of diseases. So I'd just like to focus on uh, Nusenirsen. Uh, 
which is a drug to treat uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And just very quickly uh, to highlight, since the approval of nusinersin, uh, the, the, uh, adopt, it's the uh, CDC has adopted putting uh, SMA on the newborn screening panel. So today in the United States, it's recommended to all the states in the US that they, they test infants as they're born to see if they're at risk for developing this uh, neuromuscular disease. And part of the reason is because what we have found is that if you look at uh, um, uh, the most severe form of this disease is called type one uh, SMA. And unfortunately it accounts for about half of the babies born will, will develop this disease. And uh, they develop symptoms within the first six months of life and unfortunately, they have a very short life expectancy. So they essentially become paralyzed, and the only way you can keep them alive is through ventilation and then using artificial feeding uh, to keep them alive. Um, and, and so their life expectancy was less than two years. And what we found is that when we treated these infants who were genetically diagnosed, but before they developed symptoms, that we can uh, markedly impact the disease. We haven't cured it. But these infants now are doing things that uh, was never heard of. So they're developing normally. Uh, we have children now that uh, are walking uh, uh, based upon uh, treatment with this drug. And it was treatment that was started before they had any symptoms. And, and really, I think it highlights the point that uh, you know, pre-symptomatic treatment is the best way to treat uh, diseases or prevent diseases from occurring. Uh, so it's made a major impact on that disease. So in, in the future, uh, you know, I do believe that uh, our technology, the antisense technology, will continue to evolve. The current technology is an injectable drug, so either subcutaneous for some of the uh, deliveries or as uh, 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 tissues, or as Adrian highlighted, intrathecal for the CNS diseases. Uh, but we, I can see a path that we're going to ultimately get orally delivered antisense drugs. And uh, we are, we're doing a number of studies today uh, where we're doing clinical trials using this technology where we're delivering it orally. So I, I think we're not uh, too far away from having that being a reality. And the other advantage that we'll see is being able to specifically only target certain tissues in your body. So uh, most drugs will distribute throughout your body and produce a, effects in, in the tissues that you want it to produce effects. But a lot of times the side effects are, are, are due to the drug uh, binding uh, its receptor or, or its protein in uh, tissues that you don't want it to. And, and so by being able to tailor uh, where a drug goes and what tissues it works in is going to give us safer and more effective drugs uh, in, in the future. Um, other uh, genetic therapies that I see coming on the horizon, one is a, 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 a gene therapy or gene replacement therapy. And today, that's being practiced two ways. Uh, one is uh, using viral vectors that are delivering the genetic material. So if you're missing a protein, uh, you have a mutation that causes a protein to, to be missing, you can replace that protein using gene therapy. Uh, the other approach is using uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles that you heard Dr. Langer uh, present earlier uh, today is another approach to deliver these large nucleic acids. Um, we're still at the beginning uh, of this technology. It's been around a long time, and it's taken. Uh, it's a lot more complex than the antisense approach, but I, I clearly see that it's it's beginning to deliver on it, on its promise. And I see over time it's going to evolve. So it's a much more tunable uh, 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 system to to get uh, expression where you want it to be, and also to be able to control expression. So if you run into any safety issues, you can shut it back off. Uh, uh, and the, the last uh, uh, approach that I see is, is gene editing, and, and Dr. Doudna presented uh, again earlier today about her work on uh, CRISPR-Cas9, and that's uh, really a, a breakthrough uh, technology from a research lab to be able to uh, very efficiently edit genomes in, in uh, our exper experimental organisms. And you see that I can see that very uh, in the not too distant future, starting to, to impact uh, other diseases where we, we'll be able to use it as a therapeutic approach. In fact, um, one of the things I really do believe is going to uh, be identified is that there may be endogenous pathways that we can exploit to do gene editing without having to add this uh, exogenous bacterial protein. And, and so I, I think that's really futuristic, but I, I see a, that, uh, again, that's going to be something that we'll be able to do in, in, in the future. So just to uh, finalize, uh, just uh, that we, we view that the completion of the human genome sequence has dramatically advanced our uh, um, 
ability to, to identify diseases, and there are a variety of genetic uh, uh, approaches that we can use for uh, developing therapies based upon this genomic uh, uh, revolution that we're going through within biology. And uh, again, what I predict uh, is that we'll have, everybody will have their sequence, and, and I, I truly believe that knowledge is, is good for everybody. Uh, we still have to do a lot of information to be able to interpret that sequence, but uh, I, I do see that uh, uh, your ability to know what your future lies uh, based upon your genotype uh, is, is going to be very important for ma maintaining your health. And, and so finally, uh, just to acknowledge the patients and their families who participate in our clinical trials. They, uh, uh, without the patients, the bravery of, of, of the patients, we wouldn't have any drugs today, and so I just really want to acknowledge them. And then finally, my collaborators who have uh, worked with me on uh, various projects, including uh, my, my collaborator for this uh, prize, Dr. Adrian Craner. Uh, thank you very much. Well, this is very exciting, but I wonder if you would elaborate a little on the, uh, that box you mentioned of, in your earlier slide on uh, the ethics and genetic counseling issues, I was just struck, I'm struck by the Ludditeism, so to speak, genetic, well, there's genetic Luddites, you might say, uh, similar to the anti-vaccination campaigns right. we see so prominently, certainly in, in my own county here in California. Um, and getting this accepted, this approach, um, would seem to me to involve some major uh, convincing of many people. Uh, can, could you elaborate on uh, how you would visualize uh, what, getting this accepted, this general approach? Yeah, so I'm probably not the best person uh, to do that because that's not something that I do on a routine basis. But number one, I think education has got to, we got to do a much better job uh, educating people what this information means and how to interpret it. And part of the problem in medicine is there are a lot of unknowns today. And so, uh, you know, the regulators have this paternalistic uh, attitude that if we don't know what it means, we shouldn't tell people uh, about it. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do view it as being one of the critical issues that we have to resolve. And I, number one is education. I think we need to do a much better job of educating uh, our, our colleagues and, and our neighbors and uh, uh, the rest of the people in this country uh, what science is and what, how to use the information that science has provided. It's not you know, the meaning of life, but it, it gives us an ability to manage our own health. Uh, Is the information and the techniques that you are using now being applied uh, to the other end of the lifespan, that is anti-aging concerns and increasing longevity, Sure. perhaps by focusing on part like the loss of muscle mm -hmm. in the elderly and... Yeah, so, so clearly within the industry, that's um, a, a, a focus of part of the industry. There's what I'll call a, a part of the industry that's exploiting uh, people for, for that, where um, I don't want to quite call them snake oil salesmen, but I think some of them were very close to being snake oil salesmen. But within the legitimate uh, pharmaceutical industry, there's a recognition that that's part of our health, and uh, there's a lot of research going on into you know, looking at muscle as an example, and how do we maintain muscle strength, or how do we maintain uh, our cognitive abilities as we age, and, and so, uh, we're not there yet, but I, I do see that we'll, you know, that is an area of the future for, for the uh, in industry and, and for us. Yeah, I had a question. Would this gene therapy help someone grow who's stun whose growth is stunted through puberty? So, um, potentially. I mean, again, with the, the genetic identification, there are genes that cause, say, dwarfism or, or a short stature. And um, I'm not sure we'll be able to fix that, and I'm not sure we should. Um, but, uh, you know, because I, I do feel that the diversity is what makes us a, a society. Yeah, but I, I do think that for people who have uh, sort of a medical condition that can develop because of the dwarfism, uh, that there may be ways that we could prophylactically prevent it from occurring or at least minimize the impact of, of the disease. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, a terrific talk. I was intrigued by the idea of a, um, a, a human encoded CRISPR like molecule and, and was wondering whether you could um, hypothesize about where one might find something in it, perhaps in the immune system or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so I think what we've learned from biology over the years is that the, uh, what one organism develops as a system. Uh, it's actually replicated uh, throughout life, and there may be it may be totally vestigial, uh, but you know we've found evidence that there's CRISPR-like sequences in the human genome, um, and so why those sequences are there? As I said, they could be vestigial and no longer of impact, but it kind of makes you wonder if uh, there are pathways that we just don't understand today that may uh, th this you may be able to exploit therapeutically and. and that's very conjectural at, at this point, but it's, it is intriguing that these sequences exist. Uh.